Welcome back to New Rockstars. I'm Anna Vanston, and this Sunday, January 15th, is the premiere of The Last of Us on HBO. So I wanted to make this video to help flush out the world for those who have either never played the games or just want a refresher and convince you of why you need to see this show, whether you've played it or not. Now, I've worked really hard to make sure this is a completely spoiler-free video so that everyone can fully enjoy the journey, so please join me in keeping the comments section spoiler-free as well. So let's talk about the world we'll be entering. In the game, most of the story takes place in a post-apocalyptic, relatively relatively modern day society 20 years after a devastating infection spread throughout the world. The game only very briefly touches on what the pre-pandemic world was like, leaving the player to piece together clues through discovered notes, letters, and recordings. However, Gabriel Luna, who plays Tommy in the show, disclosed that the show will be living in that time before and during the outbreak for much longer than the game. In addition, while the game relied on staying in the perspectives of Joel and Ellie in order to keep the player immersed, the game's creator, Neil Druckmann, and the showrunner for the HBO series, Craig Mazin, said in an interview that they found a freedom in moving through time and space in the show, showing things happening before and during the start of the apocalypse, as well as outside of America. While leaving things vague in the game left room to use your imagination, I'm actually really excited for them to expand upon the world a bit more and allow us to grow closer to these characters. And it'll be super interesting to see how the outbreak plays out in other parts of the world too. So let's talk about the outbreak. The infection in question is known as the cordyceps brain infection, or CBI, which comes from the cordyceps fungus infecting humans' brains, causing them to become hyper-aggressive and lose rational thought, as well as mutating their bodies with fungal growths. Hope you're not eating. A newspaper you can read at the beginning of the game indicates that the offending mutated strain of the cordyceps fungus originated from contaminated crops imported from South America. And although the FDA attempted recalling imported crops from several suspect countries, a few months later, roughly 60% of the world's population was either dead or infected. And that's why I always say, don't eat your veggies, kids. Today's video is sponsored by Wonder. I'm not an artist. So normally when I think of something I wanna see, like, giant fungus monster, or mushroom zombie, or I don't know, cuddly mushroom man. I have to rely on a show like The Last of Us to make it happen. But with Wonder, I don't have to rely on anybody else to make my dreams a reality. Wonder turns ordinary text prompts into incredible pieces of art using cutting edge AI. It's like having an assistant who's a phenomenal artist that lives to create the stuff you want to see. I have spent hours and hours building up a library of mushroom zombies, doing things Joel and Ellie dare not dream of using Wonder. And now I get to share those images with my friends. It's great. Wonder is a free download, but if you upgrade to premium, you'll have no ads, unlimited art, faster load times, and over 20 additional styles you can use. Click the link in the description box to get started with Wonder and put your creativity to the test. 20 years later, we can learn more about CBI from an in-game pamphlet and infographic from the Federal Disaster Response Agency, or FEDRA, which replaced the United States government as the nation's leading authority after the outbreak. In the game, CBI in the present day is transmitted via breathing in the spores emitted by the cordyceps or via contact with bodily fluids of an infected individual, usually by being bitten. However, they decided against using spores in the show due to the unrealistic nature of keeping an airborne contagion confined to small areas like in the game, instead replacing them with tendrils on the infected's bodies. This is actually not too far of a departure from the source material, as concept art for the game showed illustrations of some infected having tendrils, and Druckmann likes the idea of having the infected being able to interconnect like networks of fungi to unite against prey as one. But if you get bitten or potentially stung, maybe? Good luck, because there's no cure, as all attempts to make a vaccination have failed, and there's no way to lengthen the incubation period. And just to put a cherry on this delicious fungus pie. The cordyceps fungus does in fact exist in the real world, infecting carpenter ants and compelling them to leave their nest to find an ideal climate for the fungi's growth and die there so the fungus can grow out of them. But luckily in the real world, it only affects ants for now. In the game, there are four stages of infection. Stage one begins within two days of infection when the cordyceps has taken over the victim's motor functions. Known as runners, they are fast and agile and travel in packs. Stage two can develop anywhere within a year of infection when the infection has completely taken over the brain and begins to develop outward fungal growths on the head and spread to other parts of the body as well. Known as stalkers, their senses are still intact so they maintain the sight and agility of runners but actually strategize by hiding to ambush victims or flanking and attacking from behind. After a year year of infection, the host reaches stage three. At this stage, they are known famously as clickers, as the fungal growth has reached a point of blinding them, making them reliant on their use of echolocation paired with their acute hearing. They are stronger, more vicious, and extremely lethal. If an infected host is able to remain alive for several, several years, which is rare, they can reach the fourth stage, known as bloaters. Covered in hardened fungal plates that act as armor, these infected are extremely strong and can throw acidic balls of spores torn from their own bodies. There's also a type of infected called 
called shamblers, but it's unknown whether this is a fifth stage or a variation of the fourth stage that's dependent on if they're exposed to large amounts of water and or humidity. Anyway, they grab onto prey and expel acidic spores that burn the victim. Now, it's been revealed that there will be some infected individuals that are unique to the show, but Naughty Dog, the studio behind The Last of Us game, had concept artists work with the show's team to make sure everything coherently fit together, and I cannot wait to see what these new designs will look like. So like I said, most of the story takes place 20 years after the initial CBI outbreak, which in the game is 2033 since the outbreak started in 2013, but promotional materials for the show placed the outbreak in 2003, meaning that this will set the show truly in the current day. That's fun. Now allow me to describe this hellscape. The collapse of the economic and political pillars of society due to the outbreak has given rise to military-run quarantine zones in cities across the U.S. Remember Fedra? Yeah, they declared martial law and now exercise absolute law over the quarantine zones. Whoops. Survivors who seek refuge in these quarantine zones are reliant on rations, which are frequently lacking or withheld, and poor conditions lead to unrest, rebellion, smuggling, and even groups set on uprising against the militia, the biggest of which is a group known as the Fireflies. The Fireflies are a rebel group set on taking down Fedra to restore the government, and also working to find a cure for CBI. While some citizens of the quarantine zone stand with them, especially when members are publicly executed by militia, others criticize their lack of pulling their own or fear the potential of the Fireflies replacing Fedra, so support for the group is shaky. While life's tough inside the quarantine zones, it's no picnic outside of them either. Individuals and groups who travel or live outside the zones also have to survive a different type of environment, one overgrown by nature and filled with constant threat from both the infected and fellow humans doing anything to survive. With life being as tough as it is with the state of the world, humanity has developed a doggy -dog, dog mindset that leads to some major conflicts when people cross paths in competition for food, supplies, and land. It's hard to tell who to trust in an environment where bands of ravagers and families just trying to get by can be indistinguishable or even one in the same. So that is the brutal environment we're likely dealing with in this show, but who is the show about? I want to lightly touch on some of the people we'll be introduced to in the beginning of the show, and again, don't worry, there will be no big spoilers. Everything mentioned here is either in the show's trailer or some of the first vague information we get in the game. So the first three characters we're introduced to are Joel, Sarah, and Tommy. Sarah is Joel's thoughtful daughter who has an upbeat personality and playful sense of humor, and Tommy is Joel's brother, a rugged yet compassionate passionate man who is close with the pair. Now Joel is our main character, and he's a man whose hard past has made him develop a callous and cynical nature. And while in the game Joel is incredibly resilient and extremely agile, in the show Mason wanted Joel's character to be less bulletproof, both physically and metaphorically, stating he likes his middle-aged people to be middle-aged, thus introducing to the character ailments like hearing damage from gunfire and knees that ache when he stands up. And I think this will help the character feel more vulnerable. After all, in a video game, you can take eight bullets to the face and be A-OK, -okay, and even if you die, you just respawn. But a TV show needs to add real risk to all the character's actions in order to get the viewer invested. So I think having him be more susceptible to danger gives his moments of badassery more weight. It's a word. Look it up. Merriam-Webster Dictionary, badassery. Post-outbreak, we're introduced to Tess, Joel's longtime smuggling partner who works with him to get weapon supplies and other contraband in and out of a quarantine zone in Boston. Tess is an independent, street-smart survivor who is respected by those that know her, as well as Joel's closest ally and confidant. The game keeps their exact relationship description close to the chest, and we'll have to wait and see if the show does this as well. While on a job, Joel and Tess meet Marlene, who is the courageous, strong-willed leader of the Fireflies, played by Merle Dandridge, who is the same actress who voiced and provided the motion capture performance for the character in the game. This is the only performer from the game who is reprising their role, and she's expressed in interviews how excited she was to get to explore the character's complexities again, saying that over the course of 10 years between the game and the show, she has gotten an opportunity to mature as an artist, mature into the role, and really get to know her on a deeper, more inherent level. I personally am so pumped to see what she adds to the performance this time around. And it is Marlene who assigns Joel and Tess the task of transporting our other central character, Ellie, to the Capitol building. Building. Ellie is a blunt, impulsive 14-year-old who still manages to hold on to hope despite the bleakness of the world around her. Clever and resourceful, she's insistent that she doesn't need to be babysat. One thing that makes Ellie one of my favorite characters is her sense of humor, which I think Bella Ramsey will absolutely nail. While there's a lot of mystery surrounding her character, as we see in the trailer, it is her potential immunity to CBI that launches the expedition to escort her west where Akira is being worked on. And while that's our main cast of characters, there are so many more juicy characters and storylines. 
Druckmann teased that along the journey, our protagonists will be meeting new characters and situations unique to the show that are self-contained and promise to pack a punch. So now that I've set the scene, I'm gonna sell the crap out of it. I'm gonna talk to those who haven't seen or played the game first. The Last of Us is known for having one of the greatest stories in video game history. There's a reason they're making it into a TV show instead of one of the other zillions of games out there. This story explores themes of loss, humanity, purpose, loyalty, perseverance, self-preservation, family, nature, survival, and so much more. If you think this is just gonna be another zombie show, Nah, man. It examines deeper concepts, like the flourishing of nature without human interruption, or as Druckmann says, the beautiful and horrible things that can come out of a parent's unconditional love for their child. Speaking of the flourishing of nature, this show is also going to be beautiful. One of the coolest aspects of this game is the design of the world outside of the quarantine zones, where nature has reclaimed abandoned cities with buildings that are overgrown with plants and animals free to explore previously unoccupied spaces. Inspired by The World Without Us, a book which speculates how the world would be affected if humans suddenly disappeared. It also reminds me of the articles that were coming out in the real world about wild animals venturing into cities while everyone was quarantining in 2020. In the game, as much as the outside world poses a threat, its stark contrast against the quarantine zone's bleakness is breathtaking. There's beauty in the brutality, which is even extended to the infected. In an early version of the script, when referring to an infected host, Mazin wrote, he lifts his head, the sun shines warmth on his face, he rises slightly toward it. A soft breeze flutters through his hair. This is a living creature in a living world. I mean, how am I supposed to refer to them as enemies with a description like that? They may want to put a ring on its finger. But seriously, it goes to show that everything is being treated with such respect in this world, and I love that. On that same note, the story also features notable minority representation and strong and capable female character representation, which are always pluses in my book. Now for those who have played the game and are worried that the show won't be able to replicate it. Well, First of all, it won't. But that's a good thing. There's no reason to create a perfect replica of the game. You could just go watch a playthrough on YouTube for that. But this adaptation is in the best hands it could possibly be in. The creator of the game and story is making this show, and he is handling it with such care. In fact, in 2014, Druckmann was offered the chance to make a film version of The Last of Us, but feared that the story couldn't properly be told in a movie-length feature and had a different creative vision from the executives, who were pushing for something more action-packed like World War Z, when he wanted something with more heart that focused on the relationship of the characters, citing influences like Children of Men and the novel City of Thieves. It wasn't until he met up with Craig Mazin that he felt the story could be done justice. Mazin knew The Last of Us extremely well and agreed that the story would be better told through a TV series. And Mazin had already made Chernobyl for HBO, which had won 10 Emmys and excelled at portraying complex characters and making grisly moments impactful. Druckmann even said that in their pitch meeting for the show, Mazin pitched it with such a passion that Druckmann was newly moved by the story that he himself created. Both of them knew that to make the most impactful piece of art possible, they wanted to focus on the relationship aspects of the story rather than the action. And when there was action, they wanted each death to hold weight, unlike in the game where you can mow down 50 people in one area and just go about your day. And if you're more interested in the action-packed part of it, don't worry, it'll still have plenty of survival horror elements with a budget higher than the first five seasons of Game of Thrones to bring all those lovely infected to life. So we have a show set in an astonishing world with deep, complex characters and a story with an incredible amount of heart made by people who cherish it. What more could you ask for? Mazin had a quote about the show that I really loved. It's that it examines the people who want to make everybody better and the people who want to protect particular people at any cost. Ooh, shivers. So I will definitely be tuning into episode one, and if you're joining me in this journey, be sure to follow along as we break down each episode every week. Until then, you can follow me on Twitter at It's Anna Vanston, and follow and subscribe to New Rockstars at New Rockstars for more breakdowns of everything you love. And I promise not to show you that gross clip of the ant again. Ding.